Uh, welcome everyone. I'm um, I'm Lian Ho. I'm a professor competitional from uh, Koguan School of Law, Shanghai Jiaoping University. I'm uh, delighted to chair the second panel of um, the conference today. It's already the second panel. The, the title of the second panel is the impact of CBDC for business community and the challenge for regulation and compliance. So in this panel, we'll have um, two speakers and two commentators. Uh, please allow me to introduce uh, our uh, first speaker. Before the introduction, I should say that um, uh, the time is limited for the second panel, so every speaker just get like 15 minutes to present um, your ideas. So this first speaker is uh, Professor Ross Buckley. He's a member of uh, the Herbert Smith's uh, Free Hill uh, Cyber Center. Ross joined the faculty in 2007 and was appointed as a science uh, uh, scientific professor uh, in international finance law in 2013. His principal area of research interest is in regulatory measures to increase the resilience and the stability of financial system. Ross has written a substantial number of publications exploring how China might effectively participate in international financial governments. Uh, his uh, present particular focus is on the regulation of digital finance services in a range of uh, jurisdictions, including China. He has uh, published um, uh, many books and articles, and uh, is uh, currently leading for major research projects. Uh, so he's um, a very renowned uh, scholar in this field. So I'm um, uh, so let's uh, let's welcome Ross for his um, ideas. Thank you, Liang, and thanks for the opportunity to be here today. So I'm going to be speaking about China's DCEP, which is what China calls its central bank digital currency and its data consequences and why I think it might well be the catalyst for change right around the world in this regard. So next slide, please. Seeing I'm the first in this session, I'll define a central bank digital currency. It's basically a digital currency issued by a sovereign. So it's like a cryptocurrency, it's protected by cryptography, but it's different from the cryptocurrencies we're familiar with because it's denominated in national sovereign currency and it's issued by a sovereign. So in other words, a digital euro, a digital US dollar, a digital renminbi. This is really significant because this is central bank money. And most of us in the world don't deal in central bank money except when we deal in cash and cash is obviously in most places becoming less and less significant all the time. So when you get paid your salary, when you pay your rent, when you pay your mortgage, you're not dealing in central bank money, you're dealing in commercial bank money. But a CBDC would be central bank money that has some massive changes for some systemic risk things, massive changes for lots of things. That uh, it can operate on a single centralized ledger or it can operate on a decentralized distributed ledger. China is, is running its on a centralized ledger and frankly that makes sense because decentralized ledgers, the sort of thing you see with, with, in coupled to blockchain, are really useful when there's a trust problem. But central banks around the world don't suffer from trust problems. If you've got a if you're a country and your central bank's not trusted, you've got major problems. So um they can also be issued directly by the central bank or they can be uh, issued by they can the central bank can maintain the ledger but the commercial banks can do the interface with customers so customers can deal they can be set up they can be designed any way you want they can be set up so the customer gets the central bank digital currency in this case the digital renminbi directly from the central bank but central banks don't normally want to do that they don't aren't set up to do that they don't have the appetite to do it technology makes it possible but it's not the usual way i don't not what we expect we when i say we i mean dirk setcher at luxembourg and douglas Arna at hong kong and myself we've written quite a lot on this and um so then what we anticipate the normal model will be what we call a hybrid model where as i said the central bank maintains the ledger the, the commercial banks provide the interface with the customers because they, that's what they're already doing and that's what they're equipped to do. And central banks don't want to diminish the business scope for their commercial banks. That's probably not good for most economies, at least in the short term. So next slide. 
So what's China doing? Well, China's been working on this for about seven years. A lot of research, a lot of effort has gone into a CBDC for China. It's currently trialing it in four major parts of the country. It'll shortly be expanded to another three, including Shanghai and the Yangtze Delta. So it's it's once the expansion's underway, it will you know be trial being trialed in a lot of China. But um, a CBDC can purely be a currency, or it can be an electronic payment system. So China has shown very clearly what it's doing, it's doing both. That's why it calls its initiative DCEP, Digital Currency Electronics Payment, Electronic Payment. So it's a it's it's money and payments together. Traditionally there's often been a distinction legally between money on the one hand and payments on the other, but that distinction is collapsed in this case. But, um, and as I said before, it's a hybrid system. Next slide please. That um, the ledger will be run by the People's Bank, the um, the interface will be provided by the, the commercial banks in China and also the major, what are now the backbone of the Chinese financial system. In other words, Tencent and Ant Financial. But, um, the technical features of what China is proposing is that it will work offline is the first thing. So you won't need an internet connection. It follows from that that it has to be token based. If it was account based, you know, with where all the transactions had to relate back to a record on an account, then you'd need internet connection all the time. So the minute you know it, it's working offline and it needs to work offline, I think, if it's going to become the dominant currency because you can't have electricity brownouts or you know problems with the internet um, stopping payment, then it'll, it'll be token based. So people's phones will carry the tokens and they can trade tokens with other phones when they get internet connection again, that can all be reconciled. Um, it won't use blockchain because as I said, there's not a trust issue with the People's Bank. Um, as I've said three times now, I think the ledger's with the People's Bank, the customer interface is with the banks or Ant and WeChat. There's no transaction fees at the moment. And I suspect that will continue because China has strong reasons. I've been saying for about three years, the first operative CBDC in the world will come out of China because China's got the strongest motivation of any country. And, and from China's point of view, these motivations are so strong, they don't need to make money on this. They'll subsidize this because they want to see it. China wants to see it work. Next slide. So that's a problem. The no transactions fees, that's a problem for Ant and WeChat Pay and the, the payment systems that currently work in China. Right? It, it should in time make this very attractive. Stepping away from China for a moment, why would other countries issue a CBDC? Well, for some, it's that cash is simply going out of usage. In Sweden already, two thirds of bank branches don't carry cash. Uh, it's quite possible to go for months in Sweden and not use cash. If you read this two reports of late by the Swedish Central Bank, if you read between the lines in those reports, the Central Bank clearly doesn't want to be out of the business of issuing the means of exchange. The Central Bank says something like, we have issued the means of exchange for people living in this region since 1462 or some date like that. They're very uncomfortable about being out of that business because they don't want to trust financial inclusion to commercial entities. They don't trust uh, MasterCard and Visa to provide adequate payment systems to poor people or rural people or elderly people who aren't very you know, computer literate. So they think there's a role for the state there. But if cash is going to go out of business, it has to be electronic payments. It has to be digital currency. So I think Sweden probably by two years time will be issuing this. Another reason for other countries to issue it, and this applies to China, is that Facebook, most of you probably know, a couple of years ago proposed Libra um, as its own Facebook cryptocurrency. Um, they've dressed it up to make it look like it's not purely a Facebook initiative, but it's a Facebook initiative. Don't, don't get thrown by the window dressing. Um, these days it's called DM because they got such a strong pushback from regulators right around the world. They really showed they had very little experience of dealing with financial regulators. Um, they didn't handle the regulators at all well. Their initial model was um, infringed on monetary sovereignty in quite a few countries, in most countries. So they got this tremendously strong re, um, pushback. So they've reworked it into something that infringes less on monetary sovereignty. Um, but I think a number of, certainly I think 
the proposal for a privately owned cryptocurrency out of the US was part of what pushed China into action on this. Um, another trigger would be the current pandemic and the move towards digital and presenceless payments because you know we are obviously moving more and more of our life online. That's not going to stop when the pandemic's over. So uh, CBDCs would work well in that. CBDCs give governments more information and control. If people are running their life making payments with a CBDC, a government could, you know, conceivably say, well, such and such a person is an alcoholic. Their currency is programmed to not buy alcohol. Their currency is programmed to not be able to be used in certain things. And all of the information about what citizens are spending their money on will end up in the government. That's very powerful. The, the fifth reason, and the reason that a lot of countries are working on this, you know, Canada's done a lot of work. Uh, Britain has gone to, England rather, has gone, I think, to two pilots. Um, you know, a number of countries have put a lot of effort into it, is because they know that a lot of them don't want to issue a CBDC yet. It's a fundamental change. It introduces major risks that we haven't really had in our system before. So they're then very care careful, and they should be careful. It's the nature of central banks to be careful. But if a competing nation issues a CBDC that's usable in international trade, it will interact with smart contracts that are starting to, that will dominate trade. By smart contracts, I mean self-executing pieces of software that are, um, you know, can automatically conduct at least part of the international trade um, transaction. At the moment, 20% of the cost of trade is the paperwork. That's ridiculous. 80% of the cost is moving the goods to the port, getting them across the wharf, getting them on the vessels, moving them around the world, getting them off the vessel, getting them back on the, the train, getting, that's 80%. 20% is just the paperwork. Smart contracts will revolutionize that. And as they revolutionize that and reduce that 20% to 2% or something, CBDCs will work very well. If one country issues one, it will start to get adopted in all these international trade transactions and all the information from those transactions will end up in the capital city of the country that's issued them. So in this consideration today, if China lets DCEP offshore, and it won't initially, it'll make sure it's working very well onshore before they release it for trade. But if they release it for trade or a variant of it for trade, other countries will, I think, be forced to follow because they won't want all that information in Shanghai. Next slide, please. So these are the reasons China might issue it. Surveillance and social control. To promote financial inclusion, it would have beneficial effects in you know, the more poor remote parts of China. Um, the third reason is a big one. If they release DCEP offshore, it'll, it'll be part of this attempt to build a long-standing effort to build a parallel financial system. And for a long time, the US has received huge advantages from minting the global reserve currency. Barry Eichen Green, a wonderful economic historian at Berkeley, wrote a wonderful book called Exorbitant Privilege quite a while ago that analyzed all the ways the US benefit from producing the global reserve currency. China wants some of that action. China has been unfairly and unwisely limited in its participation in the organs of international financial government governance. And very 10 years ago, China decided it wasn't going to keep trying to play in a World Bank IMF system from which in which it wasn't adequately represented. It would build its own parallel system. So it internationalized the renminbi. It started to denominate international trade contracts in renminbi, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Took a lot of measures to promote the renminbi as an international currency. I think this DCEP going offshore is another reason. That's another reason to do it. That uh, it'll improve macro policy making, macroeconomic policy making. Most of the data related to payments in China at the moment sits in Ant Financial or Tencent. It obviously the government would prefer to have that data rather than having it sit in those two companies. Next slide, please. So China's response is. DCEP is in part a response to Libra. There's also now talk of a digital US dollar, so it might be that. Um, the US has a strange relationship with its dollar, which I won't go into, but um, the US is quite comfortable. There's, there's forces in US politics that are very comfortable with a private currency, you know, 
owned by, operated by Facebook. That's obviously anathema to China and is another big reason China is pursuing this response. Next slide. So at the moment, China is doing what it does. It's crossing the stream by feeling for the stones with one's feet. It's going cautiously, but it's in the lead. DCEP is a lot more advanced than any digital currency any, anywhere else in the world. Uh, it's got a long standing motivation to displace the US dollar and not to completely replace it, but simply to have a number of global reserve currencies of which the Chinese currency is one. Other things in that move are the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank that's headquartered in Beijing, the New Development Bank that used to be called the BRICS Bank headquartered in Shanghai. These are all parts of this long-standing initiative to displace or at least share the issuance of global reserve currency. And I strongly see DCEP as another part of that um, movement forward. A lot, of, a lot of people don't. A lot of people don't think it will be released offshore. I don't agree with them. We Give me five years and I know if, I'll know if I'm right or I'm wrong. Next slide, please. I think the, mis the world made a big mistake. As China started to grow, it needed to readjust voting rights on the World Bank and the IMF to give China a, a decent role in those institutions, but it never did. So as I said before, I think China is now building its parallel system and DCEP is part of that. But, um, in the old days, the, the sort of general advice was follow the money. Today, I think a better rule of thumb is follow the data because once DCEP is used in domestically in China, there's going to be a massive amount of data that the Chinese government has about every aspect of every citizen's smallest transactions in their life, assuming that it becomes really popular, which I think it will. Once DCEP is left let offshore, if it's used in international trade, all of that data will flow back to China. At that point, the Australian government won't be comfortable with all the trade between China and Australia being denominated in DCEP. There will be a digital Australian dollar. We don't need one. The RBA has said we don't need one domestically. We will get one, I think, as a trade instrument in the fullness of time. Next slide. So a couple of ironies. At, um, Facebook really went for Libra, went for DM, DM, I think, because it wants masses and masses of data. And it saw the um, precedent set by WeChat. WeChat, as everybody knows, is pretty much the app for everything in China. It's the app on which one conducts one's life. Facebook wants to be that, but you've got to have payments as part of the picture. If people have to leave the app to make payments, it's not the app on which you conduct everything. People leave, they don't come back. They do some things off the app. So it was like WeChat set the way forward and Facebook copied that. Facebook then proposed to launch Libra, which was in a lovely circular thing. It prompted China to then issue DCEP as a sort of market-based retaliatory measure. The second irony is that in Australia, we are having a major data initiative called the Consumer Data Right that's, you know, in a free market economy, uh, the result of a government initiative. In China, the major data initiative has been the product of two private companies, WeChat and Ant Financial. So I like the ironies. Next, next slide. And in terms of following the data, this is what's at stake, right? Whoever ends up with the most data basically wins in terms of, you know, pricing products, in terms of business size, in terms of social control, in, in terms of everything. So, um, you know, I like the crowns. On that note, I think the next slide is just some some papers. We write too many papers. If you're suffering from insomnia, you can feel, throw up the next one. Yeah, lots and lots of play, papers. You can click on the link. There's quite a few in there on this sort of stuff, particularly the first one. But that's enough from me. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, thank you, Russ, for your presentation. Uh, it lays uh, a very good background uh, for DCP launched by China. Oh, ah. Currently, only at the experimental stage. Uh, from what I understand, Roster just uh, uh, pointed out the international aspects of um, of the DCEP. Uh, it seems that uh, he believes that DCEP will very will have a very bright future, at least at the international level. And also, he expressed a concern over the data collection 
by Chinese government through using the CEP. Uh, okay, now, now we are going to have the second speaker. Sorry, it's not Professor Shen Wei, because uh, he already pre uh, presented uh, his slides uh, in the first panel. So now we are going to move to the third speaker, uh, who is uh, Mr. Lance uh, Blockley. Uh, Mr. Blockley is a, man a managing director of the initiative group, which is consulting firm specializing in payments. Mr. Block, uh, uh, Blockley has um, served uh, his clients in many countries like the UK, USA, Asia, Australia. He has um, he's, uh, he's leading a consultant team on a number of uh, industry-wide assignments, including successful removal of signature on card payments in Australia, etc., etc. He has um, he's a um, he has amazing education background. He has a degree uh -huh. from Cambridge and also from Switzerland. And his uh, topic today is what may be driving the need for CBDC in different parts of the world. Uh, Lens, the floor is yours now. Uh, thank you, Liang. Um, I need to admit right up front here that uh, I'm a central bank digital currency skeptic, particularly in the Australian context. Uh, most people, as we heard in panel one from Chris Thompson of the Reserve Bank, most people in Australia are already dealing with a digital currency. Uh, and if you go on internet banking, the money that you see in your accounts is all digital. And the use of cash in Australia already in steep decline, accelerated by COVID, uh, such that people are adopting a wide array of electronic ways to pay that have been made available to them. And people are not sort of protesting in the streets about they don't have ways to pay and they're having difficulty in making payments. So today, interestingly, most Australian cash is being used as a store of value, not as a way of making payments. And those hoarders, which are both up in Asia and here in Australia, probably 50-50 in terms of the value, um, are choosing to hold those banknotes themselves rather than having their money in a bank. Um, the, the biggest reason that people give who are still using cash uh, and they legitimately have a preference for it is that it's a great way to budget. Because if you start the week with $200 in your pocket, you've sort of limited yourself to how much you're gonna spend. And of course, there are, however, many reasons to use cash illicitly, uh, given its anonymity uh, as a uh, Ross said earlier that currently you can't trace the way people are spending cash and their money. So if you use cash, it allows you to avoid GST, income tax, employee on costs, a whole range of uh, other uh, imposts, uh, let alone if you're into drugs and guns. Uh, naturally, cash is your uh, uh, payment of choice. Um, so in the legitimate world, at least here in Australia, I prima facie, there doesn't seem to be a strong case for CBDC. However, looking around at the drivers in different parts of the world, um, that perhaps there is a more compelling case in other destinations. So let's look at Sweden. And Ross mentioned this earlier. Uh, I visited Stockholm in June uh, 2019 and that was leading a study tour to look at how Sweden was going cashless and it's true to say that in Stockholm itself it's hard to find a merchant or restaurant that will take cash. There are lots of signs that say cash not accepted. Um, but during that tour, when we were talking to people about how and why Sweden was going cashless, uh, we received a very good presentation uh, from 
somebody who's very much familiar and involved in the development program at the Riksbank on Sweden's own CBDC. And on what asking why there was a need for such a digital currency, um, we were told that the driver is primarily because consumers distrust the viability of the commercial banks in times of economic stress. And this is particularly true since the global financial crisis when many banks in Europe uh, either failed or needed government assistance to survive. And Swedish consumers, therefore, are much more comfortable with the idea of having an account and their money with the central bank, uh, which could be achieved by a CB uh, central bank digital currency, knowing that the government is sitting behind their money as and when they need it. Uh, it's true that in a number of countries, including Australia, the government does that today uh, in this country up to uh, $250,000 on deposit with an ADI is guaranteed by the government. But at least in Sweden, they'd rather actually physically have an account with the central bank and have their currency uh, guaranteed. So that's Sweden. If we move on to China, and Ross has done a, a great job co covering off uh, that uh, country and their move, but Prior to the arrival of Alipay and WeChat Pay uh, with their QR code payment systems, um, domestic payments in China were unbelievably skewed to cash, banknotes. Uh, that was despite the issuance by China Union Pay of hundreds of millions of cards, uh, debit and credit cards across the country, people still kept cash in usage. But the adoption of Alipay and WeChat Pay uh, has been extensive and it's been rapid. And uh, a significant proportion of cash-based payments have been displaced in, in a matter of years. So for the central government, th there's still clearly an opportunity to displace the remaining uh, amount of cash, which is expensive, an expensive form of payment, therefore to improve efficiency. But there's also the opportunity of displacing Alipay and WeChat Pay with an easy way of paying with the CBDC. Um, it has, of course, the added benefit of monitoring and control. Part of the attraction of cash in many countries is that it's anonymous and transactions can go undetected. But as soon as you move to a central bank digital currency, it's an electronic form and it's traceable. So the authorities in China will be able to track and trace the financial activities that were previously out of sight. Back here in Australia, as I noted in the introduction, there doesn't appear to be any strong driver to launch an Australian central bank digital currency. And indeed, we've seen and heard from the RBA that they're pretty unsure about the case for that type of currency. But the RBA uh, doesn't want to be left out of the move by so many central banks uh, to explore digital currency, uh, th that they're developing and piloting one anyway. And just to pick up again on what Ross finished off with is that in international trade, they wouldn't want the international trade out of Australia, which is a cornerstone of the economy, uh, to suddenly be um, open in all of its facets to a foreign digital currency. So that's really all I wanted to say. I'm skeptical of the need in the domestic market here. I can see the need in some other markets, but it appears that each market has its own drivers of why the central bank would be interested in such a currency. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Lance.
I think our panel is getting 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 just getting better and better. Uh, well, from uh, what I understood, Rust uh, presentation was uh, focusing on the digital currency itself and look at uh, the relationship between the Chinese digital currency and uh, you know the currency in other countries like in the United States. So basically his perspective is uh, focusing on the currency as uh, uh, as an individual product. And uh, since Lance is a, uh, is a specialist in payment, his presentation bring the, the discussion to like uh, a broader horizon. So he, I think he basically uh, compared currency and uh, payments uh, to, to see whether it is uh, value added to have a digital currency in addition to the, to the, uh, to the currently digitalized payment system. I think his idea is that uh, uh, with the current, uh, with the current, well, efficient uh, dig digitalized payment system, it might be not valuable to have uh, digital currency. And uh, subsequently, we will have uh, uh, two commentators. I think uh, they will bring their perspective to the discussion. And um, the first, um, the first commentator is uh, Mr. James Gong. Uh, James is a con consultant in Herbert Smith's um, Freehills uh, LLP. He has uh, extensive experience in adver uh, advertising on a variety of uh, issues like uh, MA, MA, private equity, corporate finance, uh, transaction, and uh, regulations. Uh, he He's working in a lot of industrial sectors like uh, technology, media, tele telecommunications, publications, energy. Uh, I believe uh, James uh, James uh, backgrounds might bring some valuable perspective to our discussion. Uh, so James, the floor is yours now, please. <clears throat> so thanks um, uh, for the introduction. Um, uh, I, I think a, a lot ha has been said about the CBDC um, and from a lawyer's perspective, uh, I think we you know, tend to you know, look, look at the uh, sort of you know, the, the, the intentions and, and implications of uh, the laws um, in, in, in practice. Um, <coughs> so for CBDC, well, um, my direct sort of perception is that you know it used to achieve two things. The one is to um, is the the ambition of internationalizing. The RMB uh, has has already been said. I think the reason for this um, is uh, partly uh, because of the you know the the, the efforts to uh, sort of uh, um, uh, to to. Uh, give China some leverage in the world dominated by the US dollars and also the financial transaction system uh, established on the SWIFT system. Now that is uh, the, the world that's basically uh, established by uh, the US, whilst the China uh, will have to establish something of its own to uh, enable it to continue um, to transact with other countries um, in the world and, and also allow other countries to use renminbi and more and more um, and if that is relied uh, if that, that that is relied on upon the existing you know, financial um, systems that means that it will still be pretty much controlled by uh, the US and given the you know the the diplomatic complexity, between the two countries, I think it has become more urgent for, for China to roll out the CBDC uh, in the world. Uh, I think the other uh, intention of the CBDC is to sort of tightening the control on on the whole payment system. Uh, as it's been, uh, as we have discussed, you know, um, and financial web WeChat Pay, they have dominated the payment system. Um, a lot of people, the reason, you know, they, they they don't feel that they use their bank account that much on the, uh, on a daily basis. In, in real in real life, they will rely uh, pretty much on 
the two payment institutions um, for their for daily you know expenses. And they, but it used to be the case that um, a, a large number of um, a lot a large amount a huge amount of um, uh, of of cash or fund was de was deposited with uh, the two major um, payment institutions, and in the and uh, when we talk about cashless society, you know, it, 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 it you know people first think of the, the two giants, and also that that was used by the two giants as a slogan. Uh, I think a couple of years ago, but but quick was quickly stopped by the central bank. You know, the central bank was not happy with this. I mean, uh, the thing is that the center of the payment system will, will it gradually moved from the central bank to the payment institutions. And uh, um, you know, the which means that the the, the the central bank will will losing some sort of scrutiny or control over what is being transacted and um, how they are transacted. Uh, and and the the other victim of this is the the um, the com commercial banks who are playing a less a less significant role in that and and uh, in in many cases they would just play like um, uh, a a cash a cash depot for the financial institutions but that was but that has changed um, uh, especially in the past few years we have seen some key steps taken by the central banks to to cut this and um, in particular uh, the payment institutions were ordered to you know, cut off the direct settlement with the bank and all the transactions would have to be moved to uh, more of a state controlled union pay and the newly formed NAS union but uh, having, having said that 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 wouldn't have solved the, the the problem. The thing is that the the, the payment channels were still in control of you know uh, 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 of third parties and and for 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 the for the central bank it is critical that um, they have to rule out something that will enable them to control not only the the um, uh, the, the the control over you know uh, providing the the legal tender the currency to the society but also uh, the payment channels and and I think this the the both could be achieved by the CBDC uh, in one go um, and the and and also um, where other uh, concern for a CBDC is perhaps the uh, the popularity of uh, cryptocurrency or you know, tokens um, that 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 is uh, uh, you know that we have seen in a in the past few years, um, especially when a lot of uh, cash were invested in coins uh, being being traded overseas, etc. Actually, in China, cryptocurrency is banned. You cannot use crypto uh, currency like bitcoins. Bitcoin trading is not permitted. Um, but I think the central bank has really seen the prospect of you know of the a blockchain technology. They believe in uh, that technology and, and they see that it has a future in the financial system. But they have to work out a way of utilizing that. Um, uh, apparently, um, uh, you know. Cryptocurrency like bitcoins uh, is not a solution. It is not. It is. It is decentralized currency. So I, my, my understanding is that perhaps the central bank was want something that is um, um, that is that 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 can can use can take advantage of the blockchain technology, but also somehow centralized. Um, it has the benefit of blockchain technology in terms of uh, uh, its reliability and also uh, its traceability and also uh, you know all the, uh, the the sort of security etc. But also uh, it gives the government control over uh, the payment system. So um, I think that is why um, this, the the CBDC is getting. Uh, its momentum um, in, the, in the past few years. And uh, in 2010, we have seen the new uh, banking laws which provide that the 
currency could be in uh, the you know, could be uh, could it be a tangible or intangible form. Um, so that pre pretty much lays the foundation for uh, rolling out the digital currency um, uh, across the nation. Um, although we haven't seen a very clear uh, schedule for that, but it, it is it is in um, it, it it is in its way. Um, and, and in terms of the challenges, um, I think uh, what is this, uh, from from a practical perspective, I think it will sort of uh, change the way that we advise on laws such as um, um, uh, anti-money laundering um, and you know other relevant banking laws when it comes to digital uh, currency and also. Um, it will bring it will bring some new issues uh, in this area, uh, you know, such as uh, the, the the privacy issues and counterfeiting issues, um, and also whether there will be a problem of a single entity dominating, you know, the payments system, uh, which you know will have the effect of driving the 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 the, the payment institutions out of the market. And that um, that was also a concern, and um, you know, if that is the case, and how can we, in, uh, you know, protect the consumers and ensure that they have a choice in here? Because now, although we have on finance, on financial and WeChat Pay uh, sort of dominating the market, but still we have a choice. Uh, there will be competition. Um, and uh, you know, we, we feel that we have freedom of choosing between these two. Um, but if the CBDC comes out and uh, the payment institutions eventually, um, you know, their market shares shrinks or even disappear in the future, so what? Um, so, so would there be any extra control over you know, how the payment system uh, will be offered? Will be uh, you know? Will be will will be operated in a in a way that is that will benefit the the, the consumers. So uh, these are the new uh, are the new legal issues that I think um, we'll need to 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 think about uh, to think about. But on the other hand, I think um, uh, there will be uh, some uh, benefits for uh, for the commercial banks as well uh, because. Uh, in, 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 in that case, I think on the CBDC uh, framework, they will play a bigger role uh, compared to what they, they do now. Uh, and it will be um, you know, generally easier for them for them to trace the transactions to make it easy to um, for from compliance perspective in managing their cash uh, in the anti -terror, uh, terrorism financing in anti money laundering. Uh, in anti fraud, um, etc. So th that will be um, there will be the benefits, uh, and also uh, from the uh, from national security perspective, uh, I think uh, there will be tightened um, you know laws on cyber security, especially on cyber security relation relating to you know the financial payment system, um, especially when the CBDC is rolled out, um, we will see. Uh, you know, relevant measures being implemented to ensure that the system is well protected. Because that, if if you know any sort of a glitch happened to to that, that 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 could have very serious consequences um, to to the country. Um, so uh, so that that is my sort of my you know perception of, of these issues um, and th thanks very much. OK, thank you, James. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. sure. With us, your Ask ideas. Your ideas. I got some echo from background. OK. OK, now it's gone. <clears throat> OK, so James uh, points out like two reasons for the Chinese Central Bank to launch uh, CBDC. One is a pressure from uh, the so-called third-party payment system like Alipay and WeChat Pay, uh, they inflict a lot of pressures on the traditional banks. Uh, uh, so CBDC might be one of the countermeasures against the third-party payment uh, organizations. And the second one, the second pressure 
is from uh, uh, cryptocurrencies, although it's uh, banned in China, uh, but uh, it might have a <coughs> might, might has a prospect. I also heard that um, uh, there are currently a lot of um, <clears throat> black market transactions and the amount of those transactions are huge. So that might be another reason for <clears throat> the central bank to launch uh, CBDC. And uh, in the end, uh, James also <clears throat> also listed a couple of legal issues uh, uh, regarding <clears throat> regarding digital RMB. Unfortunately, we have the last commentator, Professor Shen Wei, who is um, a professor of law. I hope uh, he might uh, respond to those uh, legal issues and to see how the launch of uh, DCEP would change the, <coughs> the regulatory system in China. Uh, I don't think Professor Shen needs an introduction because uh, he was um, already introduced in the first panel. So Professor Shen, the floor is yours now. Uh, thank you, Professor Ho, uh, for your brief introduction. Uh, thanks much to Professor Buckley and uh, Mr. Broccoli for your uh, insightful presentations. Um, fortunately or unfortunately, I made a presentation uh, earlier uh, uh, this morning. So I have some uh, uh, questions, comments uh, uh, for sharing. Uh, I wrote down three words uh, after while I was uh, listening to your presentation. So one is need, the other is impact, the third one is risk. James uh, contributed his uh, thoughts on risk. So let me focus on the first two points. The first one, I appreciate uh, Mr. Broccoli's uh, concern over the need for the uh, uh, CBDC or DCEP in other countries. I totally agree. In the US, for example, US is less uh, cashless uh, compared to China. People still rely on credit cards for transactions. So this probably explains why China uh, needs uh, this uh, CBDC or DCEP uh, uh, because China is a more cashless society at this moment. Um, this also explains why other countries don't probably uh, pursue this uh, C, uh, CBDC that urgently. <clears throat> uh, I think in the Chinese context, uh, it's uh, more about domestic concern. I guess uh, uh, there's a similarity between China and the US in terms of uh, regulating platform economy. So at this, at this moment, as you know, the uh, Chinese government slowed down the listing process of Alipay, uh, so on and so forth. So there's a concern. There's also uh, there's also some regulations put forward by the Chinese government to uh, use antitrust or anti monopoly uh, monopoly uh, regulations or law on platform economy. So this explains why we need uh, we have this domestic need for. Uh, CBDC or DCEP. So that's the need issue. The second one is about impact. Uh, I think uh, uh, Professor Berkeley uh, systemically explained why this is a good thing for China, why China needs uh, CBDC from legal, societal, and economic financial perspectives, uh, which is very uh, comprehensive. I totally agree with uh, his points as well as his uh, uh, statements or opinions uh, in the articles. But I somehow, I, I somehow, uh, I'm somehow quite uh, uh, suspicious about the real impact of CBDC or Chinese version of CBDC, um, <clears throat> especially on the global governance, uh, financial governance uh, system. Uh, this is something, you know, Chinese scholars really focus on and China probably will obtain uh, the so-called first mover uh, advantage in uh, reshaping uh, global financial uh, governance uh, system or Brentwood uh, system or post Brentwood system, um, <clears throat> whatever you like to describe. And the point is uh, we are trying to offer something else, right? We're, we're trying to offer alternative uh, system or currency system. Currently, we don't have uh, uh, this global uh, currency. So probably we can offer alternative uh, uh, option uh, to the US dollar. So this is the uh, idea. But 
if you look at the Chinese uh, CBDC or this uh, DCEP, this actually is uh, the PB, uh, PBOC, the Central Bank of China, actually made it quite clear. This is only an electronic form of renminbi. This is nothing new. It's not a, a completely different currency or something else in addition to renminbi. In other words, it's just part of renminbi. The difference is the form, the formality. It's not the substance. So I, I, I'm quite suspicious about this uh, real impact. In other words, this doesn't affect the MO supply, right? The M0 supply. Um, this is only part of the liquidity and uh, the government uh, offers backup. Um, and this is, uh, you know, uh, circulated uh, in this two tier uh, system, right? The central bank will give to the commercial bank, and then the commercial bank offers this to the general public. So if that's the case, that doesn't seem to be, you know, that much uh, important or that much dramatically uh, uh, different from RMB. This is my guess, right? <clears throat> the other thing is, if this will have a global impact, uh, certainly I hope so, right? If this is, uh, this is going to have a global impact, that means this can you know, flow out of China and back to China without any foreign exchange control. But I really doubt whether Chinese government will open up the uh, financial, this is a foreign exchange market, right? So I'm thinking, I, I, I think quite hard how this will, you know, change the landscape, especially the regulatory landscape, this is a tightly controlled financial uh, uh, landscape, right? So if, if this will change, definitely this can speed up the uh, process of transforming the current global financial system. If not, then probably we need to uh, wait and see. So this uh, impact issue really bothered me quite a lot. You know, uh, I also wrote a piece of articles, but I didn't submit it to any journals because I couldn't convince myself about this real impact. Although I want to see the real impact, I hope it will change the landscape. So <clears throat> this is the second issue. Uh, in terms of the risk, uh, I just uh, have one point to add up to James' uh, comments. I think the risk, uh, certainly there are many risks involved in this uh, uh, CBDC or DCEP, for example, anti-money laundering, so on and so forth. But I guess <clears throat> there's one difference between uh, Chinese version of CBDC and Libra. Libra is a blockchain based, but Chinese uh, PBOC made it clear it's not blockchain based. In other words, you know, this is quite different from uh, Lib uh, Libra in terms of the tech technology, underlying technology. So I'm thinking how this difference will, you know, have a sort of impact on the technology, on the data protection, on the privacy. This is also something uh, troubling me at this moment. Certainly, I, I want to learn more from our distinguished uh, uh, speakers. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Professor Shen, for your ideas um, on the regulatory challenges for uh, the CBDC. According to what you said, I think uh, there may be no problem at all to launch a CBDC. It's uh, basically another version of the physical currency of RMB, so it should be fine. Uh, so uh, from now on, we have finished uh, all the presentations and uh, comments. Uh, we have to move to the next session, which is a Q&A uh, &A session. Uh, I already received some uh, questions uh, from, uh, from the re uh, registrants. And at the same time, uh, if um, you, know, you as the audience have questions, you can submit the questions uh, in the in the in the queue uh, in the queue of um, of our application there, so I can see it. I raise the questions uh, uh, to our speakers. So uh, when you when you submit your questions at the same time, I will raise um, the questions already uh, uh, collected to our speakers. So the first question uh, uh, is from uh, Jonathan Hatch. He's a senior advisor and a lawyer from. Uh, uh, ASIC Innovation Hub. 
uh, his question is, uh, how will CBDC best engage with the existing commercial and regulatory issues? I believe Professor Xin Wei has already answered that question. So we move on to the second question. Oh, I'm, I'm not sure if uh, any of you uh, would like to respond to the question. Sorry, yeah. Nice. No, no, okay. Yeah, I'll, um, okay. Yeah. I'll say that the, the um, ASIC in Australia does have uh, um, effectively already um, regulations over electronic funds transfers and electronic money. So you would imagine that the central bank digital currency, if it's an electronic transfer of funds, would comply with similar uh, regulation that exists. One of the interesting things is that cash today, if you lose a banknote or a coin, it's lost forever. You don't, you don't get that money back. But with digital currency, one would assume there'd be no losses and that if I sent you $10, you'd get $10 and I wouldn't be losing any cash out of my pockets. So in that regard, it could be considered sort of safer than having physical money. Okay, thank you, Lance. Now we move to the second question, uh, which is uh, from uh, Michael Michael Bechner is a partner from Piper Alderman. His question is, um, what will be a catalyst for the RBA to accelerate work on a retail CBDC for Australia? Uh, sorry, I, I don't know the, I don't know what is uh, RBA, but I suppose um, uh, our speakers may know it. I'll have a go at that if you like. I think um, I agree with Lance when he said there's there's really no need for a retail CBDC in Australia, and the RBA is obviously you know not in a rush to go there, um, and because really Australia leads the world in PayWave, right? Our, our payment system is not the cheapest in the world, but it's certainly one of the more effective and efficient. Um, and I understand, I don't. So I think it will be a long time before we see it. Also, if we go back to two thousand and eight, and we put a, a CBDC in the mix when Australians were getting nervous, there would have been this extraordinary, if they had accounts with commercial banks, but they had the option of an account with the Reserve Bank, there would have been this enormous rush to quality. And that's some, something that has to be built into the design of any CBDC, otherwise you're introducing a huge systemic risk into the system. You know, it, it, obviously they'll make CBD, they'll keep the commercial banks in business by making the returns on CBDC lower than the, the returns on deposits in a commercial bank, low as they are. But that won't matter in a repeat of 2008. Everybody will run into the central bank. So that must be one of the reasons that's slowing the RBA down a lot, coupled to how efficient our system is. So I think we're a long way away from a domestic one. One for international trade, as I said earlier, if China launches its offshore, that might be a different story, but that won't be within Australia. And uh, other pan panel members would like to add anything to this um, question? No? I think if what would push the Reserve Bank into thinking more about a retail digital currency would be if there was a banking crisis, if suddenly there was a loss of confidence in commercial banks, as there appears to be in Sweden and parts of Europe. But the size of the banks here and probably the government's view that they're um, sort of too big to fail uh, would stop such a crisis occurring anyway. Okay, thank you. Now we have the third question. The third question from uh, Annabella Parmigiani. Uh, she's a law student from University of Technology, Sydney. And her question is um, about uh, the security of CBDC. She would like to know uh, which one is more secure. It's like the traditional currency or CBDC. 
I think that should be an easier question. I just want to add uh, to, to add a and sort of a difficult to this question. I think there is kind of balance between security and the efficiency. So I, I also would like to ask the panel members how the CBDC would strike a balance between security and efficiency uh, for payments. So, yeah. And who would like to be the first uh, answer? As I said before, the security of cash is extremely limited because if you if you lose it you've lost it and um, and that's why you have armor guard vans and lots of security personnel when large amounts of cash are being moved around so in terms of safety i suppose or security um you'd have to say digital money in theory is safer than physical money I think the question, the um, Annabelle who's asking the question, is probably more focused on people hacking into your account and stealing your digital money, um, which of course people can try to do today out of bank accounts. But what tends to happen today is either a payment fraud, most of which today sits on card payments, or the new genre uh, and flavor of the month is scams, where the person actually authorizes the payment, but it's to somebody or to an account that is not legitimate. Either uh, somebody has inserted their own banking details where there should have been a supplier's banking details and gets the money, or uh, there are things like romance scams, investment scams, and a whole range of things. I don't think anybody as yet has um, been able to solve that issue, and that issue will sit with uh, CBDC as much as it, as it does with other digital funds today. Ross, or anyone else got comments? No, I, I, broad, I broadly agree with that. And I think it also depends on what payments you're looking at, right? I mean, there's very different levels of security in payment systems around the world. So it's what you can, there's also, it's important to remember, there is no such thing as one way of doing a CBDC yet. China is rolling something out. It's the only place I think that's rolling, only, only significant place, I mean, Cambodia has done a version of it, uh, the Bahamas have done a version, but China's the only major economy to have one. So there's still a lot of other ways CBDC could be done in different places with differing levels of security as well. The other thing I'd say about cash is cash for a small business is relatively expensive. They tend to just accept the expenses, but somebody has to take the stuff down to the bank. You know, somebody has to line up in a queue. You know, that's all expensive. It's quite expensive to handle cash. But because of legacy issues, people tend to just accept that. And uh, James and uh, Wei, do you have a? Yeah, um, I think um, it, it is um, uh, the security also. Did, I think it is the issue that has to be considered in in context. Because um, when we think about security in a pre-digital er era, when we think about security, you with usually be thinking of um, you know your cash being sort of stolen or robbed or you know um, a bank being robbed you know that sort of thing and you will have the um, the they could the 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 the, relevant, the appropriate security measures to counter that sort of risks but in the digital era you will have uh, different types of risks there were di different kind of thieves and robbers that will be targeting your digital currency. And I think the issue is still, you know, whether we'll have adequate security protection measures to protect it. Um, I think it is, uh, I, I think that for technology, it will keep developing. And uh, uh, as a result, the, the, the will, the, I think the direction will point to uh, increased efficiency in the financial system, in the payment system. And uh, as a result, the, the security technology will develop as it goes. 
Um, so I think it, it is hard to answer, you know, whether it is which one is more secure. But I think the, the issue is with uh, uh, increased or with more efficiency, if we could maintain that relatively, um, you know, uh, the security at a similar or even higher level, I think that would be a success for the digital currency. Okay. No more comments? Uh, if so, we move on to the next question from Eric. I think his question is about uh, uh, the 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 new role of the central bank when launching CBDC, because uh, the central bank will be burdened burdened more uh, in in the in the case of CBDC than than the traditional uh, currency. So so he uh, he would like to know uh, if it is an issue the central bank would be attacked by some malicious actors. Yes, there is that risk, but central bank security, that, that risk exists now, right? I mean, that famously, the central bank of Bangladesh nearly lost a whole amount of money and was lucky not to, but most central banks manage that risk. And the alternative is if you went with a distributed ledger format, I personally think distributed ledgers are significantly less secure than centralized ledgers because, you know, you if if a number of the distributed ledger nodes are not spending the sorts of vast resources that major commercial banks or central banks spend on security, you know, they, the, the distributed ledger can be hacked. So, yes, it's a single point of attack, but the resources to defend it are pretty massive. Okay, so I, I, I just uh, uh, want to add one point uh, on Chinese DCEP, which can be used offline. So uh, I'm not sure if that gives you a sort of comfort. Okay, the next question from uh, Johnny Pirovici. Uh, the question is there is a reporting on the use of a uh, declining use of cash. What about reporting on Australia using uh, Australians' usage of digital currencies? Okay, it's a question for our Australian speakers. Yeah. So, I think the the decline of cash is not because people are switching to using uh, digital or crypto currencies it's because they're using card payments primarily. So every time somebody doesn't do a withdrawal from an ATM, uh, instead of one ATM withdrawal, we get a roughly 12 debit card transactions. And if you look at all of the uh, media coverage of buy now, pay later, which is much more uh, vociferous than digital currencies, uh, all of the money that's going through buy now, pay later is less than about 1% of all payments. So digital currencies would be even less than that. So I think al although you hear a lot in the press about all these new things like buy now, pay later and digital currencies, their actual um, proportion of activity in the market is extremely small. And where the action really is, is debit card transactions, which are growing very, very strongly um, and which back, in fact, most of the buy now, pay later activity. Yes, what I'm surprised by is that the government isn't pushing for the decline of cash in Australia, because as Lance said earlier, you know, most cash is held by hoarders you know, or used illicitly. So I think something like 45% of by value of currency on issue in Australia is $100 notes. Most of us never see a $100 note. So somebody's got them. Um, either they're people who are, you know, giving their builder 30% of the cost of building the house in cash, or they're old people shoving them under the mattress so they can qualify for pensions that are subject, government pensions that are subject to a means test. Um, or, you know, in both cases, I would have thought the government had a strong interest in reducing the amount of cash in circulation, but it doesn't really seem to be advancing policies to achieve that end, and I'm, I'm not entirely sure why. 
If you look at what's happened in uh, the parliament, so we had the Black Economy <laughs> Task Force that exactly, as you say, wanted to legislate effectively against the use of cash and outlaw cash transactions above $10,000. So they'd actually be illegal to use cash in a payment above 10,000. Uh, the, um, how can I put it? The, the, the right wing members of parliament who felt it was against the civil liberties of Australians not to be allowed to use legal tender, uh, shot it down. But I, I'm with you, Ross. It should be, they should have gone ahead and outlawed it. It's, it's right up there with your, your your civil right to wear a mask in the middle of a pandemic, right? Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Now we move on to to a question from uh, from an anonymous audience. Uh, this one is quite interesting. So, is a uh, CBDC a distraction for for central bank? You know, to to. Uh, not to solving the current issues, but moving to a new, you know, new scenario. <laughs> it's the interesting one. Fear of missing out. I, I mean, I don't really think so. I, I think it's what I outlined before, that a lot of them are doing a lot of research because events outside their control might trigger the need to issue a CBDC. For instance, if you're a smaller country and something like Libra DM moves into your economy and starts to replace your national currency, you lose the ability to reduce interest rates, to inflate your economy, to stimulate your economy. You lose the ability to put capital controls around your economy in times of capital flight. You lose a lot of monetary policy levers and you may well decide you want to fight back. And if you, with a market-based sort of, you know, competitor to Libra DM, and if you're going to do that, you can't do that in six weeks or six months. You know, these are complicated things. You need a research program. You need to work out how you're going to do it for your part of the world. It doesn't mean they're going to do it, but I think most of them, most central banks prudently are getting prepared in case they have to do it. It's sort of the nature of central banks, right? You risk risk taking people don't generally join central banks and they shouldn't. Okay. Any more comments? Okay, if not, so we move to the next question. Uh, it's, a, it, it's a question, of, I think it's a question about um, the added value of CBDC. Can it uh, better solve issues like uh, inflation uh, in comparison with uh, the current uh, currency system? I don't think so because it's the same currency as somebody pointed out earlier the DCEP in China is simply renminbi it's renminbi in a different form but it's still renminbi it's going to inflate or deflate at the same rate as every other form of renmin okay then we move to another question raised by Johnny uh, Pirovici uh, the question is about uh, uh, how the central bank can effectively uh, achieve the mandatory function of CBDC uh, with no digital Australian do dollar. Australians will have to transact in other digital assets to interact with what is already the beginning of a new blockchain based global financial system like Bitcoin and uh, uh, Ethereum. So, how does Central Bank promote the CBDC? Probably. Well, I think that um, different people would have different views as to the wherewithal of Bitcoin and Ethereum as means of payment. Uh, there's been a lot of um, coverage about Bitcoin. It, it behaves like an asset rather than a means of payment. Uh, you look at the volatility of its value versus fiat currency, and it goes up and down just like gold, the stock market, or any other uh, investment asset. 
Um, it's also got rather a tainted history in its usage. Ethereum, however, I'd say has got more um, bona fide history behind it. It, it is being used by, um, or at least it, its technology is being used uh, more widely, but it, it's not like it, these things are being used day to day to make purchases in Australia or even elsewhere. Uh, if you go to the petrol station, you're not paying with Bitcoin or Ethereum uh, and the petrol station won't take it. So it's going to be a long time before they they get mainstream and it really needs a central bank digital currency to bring it into the mainstream. Okay, Ross, James, Wei, you have any comments to this question? No. Ross, you, 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 you're muting. Sorry, I, yeah. I agree with Lance. Bitcoin doesn't work as a means of payment. It's too volatile. It, and as a result, it's very expensive. You know, there, there, there are much cheaper electronic forms of payment out there than Bitcoin or Ethereum at the moment. But, uh, ultimately, when enough stuff moves on to smart contracts, which live on the cloud and operate on the cloud, central bank digital currencies will interact better with those applications than the current payment systems. But I, I, I suspect once central bank digital currencies become at all established, the market for Bitcoin and Ethereum will drop away <coughs> very quickly. Yeah, I agree. I agree with that. I think um, um, I, th I think the recognition of uh, Bitcoin as a way of, uh, tra uh, of payment for uh, for uh, uh, a way of uh, payment and and, and to, to um, transact things uh, will be limited to uh, those that are not um, no, those who do not want them the, these transactions to be subject to the governance or the control uh, of of governments and uh, for but for the majority of the transactions and these will have to be uh, to be transacted in a, in, a, in a manner that that is protected by the state law and uh, is um, you know on the auspice of the government. So uh, and in that sense, I don't think that uh, Bitcoin will become mainstream um, way of payment um, for for people. Uh, and there are, might also be political reasons for you know for the central banks and the governments for not doing it. Um, so uh, yeah, I agree with Ross that uh, it will not become a, a, a main, uh, a major, uh, a po a popular way of, uh, of of payment. Okay. Uh, the next one is a comment from Eric. So the the major issue will be the the, the massive amount of data that will be handled by the central bank. Yes, India, agree with you. Uh, now we move to the question uh, from uh, an an uh, anonymous audience. What is the major difference between China CBDC and CBDC in other countries? So I suppose uh, Professor Shen can answer the question. Uh, <clears throat> uh, as uh, uh, Professor Berkeley just said, uh, there are many different ways of doing this. I think Chinese uh, uh, approach to CBDC is quite unique in the sense that when uh, there are two tier, uh, that's a two tier structure involving both central bank and commercial banks. So it's not a uh, direct issuance of uh, CBDC by the PBOC, Central Bank of China, to the general public. That's one thing. The other thing is uh, um, uh, it's uh, uh, it's still part of uh, RMB, it's still part of the uh, money, monetary supply. So still it's subject to monetary uh, policy as well as uh, um, uh, financial regulation. So I don't know, uh, but certainly that point is still uh, valid to other countries. If uh, um, you know the uh, CBDC is only a digital uh, form of uh, local currency. Oh, it's also not blockchain based. Yeah. Hmm? It's not blockchain James? based. Hmm? 
James, you want to add anything? No, okay. No, no I'm okay, thanks. Okay, uh, okay. Uh, now we, mo we move to the last question. Uh, do you believe there will be widespread accept, uh, acceptance of China CBDC as an alternative to US dollar uh, across the world? So, uh, have there been any issues with uh, legal interoperability? Uh, well, if I go first, not yet because it hasn't happened, so there can't be issues yet with interoperability, I don't think. Um, I think China will, and also we need, I'm going out into the future now, the, the CBDC hasn't even been launched in China yet, it's only being trialled. First it has to be launched domestically, it has to work well. China won't rush this, it's not China's policy nature to rush headlong into things, it'll go very, my humble opinion, it will go very carefully into this territory. So they'll make sure it's working really well domestically, I think, before they release it for offshore use. When they do though, I think they'll make it very competitive. You know, as I said at the beginning, this is not a profit making game for China. This is a long term, you know, global influence game along, there, there's real rewards, but they, China won't try to make those rewards in the sh short term. So for financial reasons, I think it'll be the, the most affordable payment system going when they release it internationally, because China will just make that decision and it's got the resources to do that. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, I just want to add that um, uh, I, I, I agree that it, it, it is it's still too early to make any predictions of that, uh, especially when CBDC is still at its very early age in China itself. Uh, but I would say that whether um, uh, CBDC or RMB itself will become a, 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 a payment that a payment method that is you know widely accepted uh, across the world will not really depends on whether it is a, a digital currency or is it um, you know rolled out in a, in a in a different way or, or, or you know enhanced by any technology it really will depend on um, the, the the trading uh, volume uh, or the, the 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 transactions that that, that is or all the all the transactions being done between China and other countries and uh, with that with that going up, I think it, it will make it more likely for other countries to accept RMB or you know, digital RMB as a way of payment. I I I, uh, I just have a couple of points to add up. One is uh, uh, the PBOC Chinese uh, Central Bank made it quite clear uh, the um, DCEP will be firstly used locally, so it will be issued locally and uh, used locally by the Chinese people within Chinese stores in the uh, Chinese territory. That's the first point. So I'm not uh, I'm not sure how it will be spread to uh, uh, other countries. It will be will be used by others. Uh, that, that that that's something we will wait and see. That's one thing. The other thing is. Um, uh, the other thing is uh, 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 about this uh, uh, international reach, right, of uh, Chinese version. Again, uh, it depends on the size. It depends on the uh, foreign exchange control as well as uh, other factors. We have to think about when you talk about cross-border transactions, uh, so on and so forth. Yeah. Okay, Lens, as an expert in payment, do you have any opinion on the prospect of uh, digital RMB? It sounds like uh, from Wei Shen's uh, answer there that this is way off into the future. That um, first of all, it's got to go from pilot in the domestic market to more widespread in the domestic market and then it's got to get offshore recognition, it's got to go into the smart contracts that Ross brought up. If you, if you start looking that far out into the future, you've got no idea whatever, what other forms of payment might have arrived on the scene by that time. <laughs> so it, it, 
you have to be careful looking more than sort of three to five years out because technology is developed, been developing all the time. People are coming up with new creative ways to do things. And so what, what we might say today on the panel about cross-border use of China's digital yuan could get completely blown out of the water by somebody coming up with something different in just two or three years time. So uh, having said that, most payment systems develop slowly. So I even though today you can look at payments and say, oh, they're being revolutionized at a huge rate of, sp uh, of speed, most of the new ways to pay are purely veneers being laid on the top of existing payment systems. So people talk about using PayPal in Australia, but very few people here have money in PayPal. It's an immediate draw off the credit card, debit card or bank account that's linked to PayPal. PayPal is sitting as a veneer on top of the other systems. People talk about paying by Uber when they get out of a taxi. Uh, sorry, a car, because it's not a taxi, it's an Uber. When you get out of the Uber, you talk about paying by Uber, but that Uber payment is actually a, usually a credit card payment. So there are lots of new ways to pay, but they're actually just a veneer stuck on the top of the existing payment systems. So starting something completely new, like the digital currency, or even like a faster payment system, those systems take a long time to build up momentum and get volume. And by the time they get there in this day and age, somebody else might have leapfrogged them with a new idea. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree. I think uh, just imagine one day, let's say Chinese uh, uh, DCEP becomes international currency, right? Then I guess at that point, you will face the same different dilemma as the US currency is facing now. So we have to think about this. I, I Especially the Chinese uh, CBDC is backed by the government, backed up by government, and it's issued by the uh, central bank. So it's uh, again, it's part of the uh, renminbi circulation, and it's just a different form of uh, renminbi. So it will be, it requires uh, Chinese government uh, support and a financial backup. Then uh, it will face the same uh, issue and the hurdle the US government is facing now. Okay, we are doing very efficient. We have finished all the presentations, comments, and also all the questions in one and a half hour. Uh, so it's, uh, it's time to close the panel. So in the end, pr please allow me to thank all the speakers and the commentators and also our technical staff to support all the, uh, all the things, uh, you know, as a background. Uh, and uh, also thanks the uh, audience uh, who, uh, who, who are participating in this uh, event. Uh, thank you, thank you all. And uh, according to the organizer, there will be another joint uh, cyber and SED event later this year. Uh, hope you will uh, also like that event uh, later. Thank you very much. Uh, enjoy uh, the weekend. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.